And Dave, we're going to tee you up first. Why don't you share some perspective about what's going on in the nominating landscape uh, with, with the audience? Gotcha. Thank you, Dennis and NACD. Thanks for having me. On the nominating committee side, it's self-explanatory, as you can imagine. I mean, the nominating committee's main role is to build and make sure the board that they built is effective in what they do. Um, the biggest thing we find or feel is most important is the culture of that board and also more importantly, the culture of any new individual that's nominated. So the first thing that nominating committee does is basically set new directors and selects them to the board for a nomination and entrance to the board. So they will skinny the list down and then present it to the board for full approval. They also will look at who the committee chairs will be of the various committees and so forth, and who the members of those committees might be. Um, the issue of culture has become incredibly important, even more so with the stress that the pandemic put on. And we now have found in the last few years that boards will go ahead and let us do culture surveys of them. And we actually, it's kind of fun, put them on a four by four plot of what the culture is like of each individual. It's all anonymous and they always love to guess who's who, where, which we will not <laughs> tell them. But so when they see a new board member, where will that fit in? And that's become more common as we've seen because the pandemic got a lot of boards very introspective. The next one is on the succession side. The board's main role is also to look at the succession of other board members over various time horizons. There's always the immediate need of who's going to sign out next year or who needs to retire. More and more boards have mandatory retirement age, although those are moving out. But the idea being is, is getting board members that have the skill sets and align with the corporate strategy over various time frames. What do we need the next year? What do we need in the next five years? So a lot of the discussion we've had has been around individuals, not what are you looking to replace and what skill are you missing? What new skill do you need? Because a board member leaving is also a new opportunity to do that. And it's hard because boards will often need your back to the issue of let's replace just what we need and what we're losing. And we always are trying to push to say, no, let's look a few years out. What might you be needing? Because board terms easily can last seven, 10 years plus, depending and so forth. Um, the whole issue of board succession has gotten to be such a big deal. Uh, there's now matrices that are built of skills and needs that are basically interfaced with the strategy of the board to look at those skills to be much more scientific. And this area grew dramatically during the pandemic as boards got more introspective and were dealing with difficult issues on looking and taking longer time horizons on succession. Last of all is on the induction side, and that is when a new board member comes in they will go ahead and look to train that member. And the corporate world is very much up their game. The, the public side very much, private side is catching up on the training and induction to make that board member as effective as they can. And especially when you consider you may have at minimum only four meetings a year to get that person inculcated into the board, the strategy and the company, the quicker you can make them effective, the better that happens. On the NOM side, what you'll generally find is the chair of that committee generally is someone fairly important. And because of the board culture and the composition of the board being so important, you tend to get the more experienced board members that know what good looks like and have seen other board members because there are plenty of CEOs or great CEOs, but board memberships a little bit of a different deal when you're not chairing it and you have to kind of take a step back. So what's happened is it tends to be the more experienced and the chair of the NOM committee tends to go ahead and be either the chairman, exec or non-exec of the board tends to be chair of the NOM gov committee. And obviously they have a very keen interest in making sure that works well. But to give you a sense, the average chair of a nominating committee is generally just about four years. And that's up from three years a few years ago. So it's a little bit longer, but it still is just a few years. And to give you a sense, of the boards out there, the uh, S&P 500 right now, about 32% of nominating chairs are diverse. Uh, and scratch that, that's uh, actually another board statistic we'll talk about later. 32% of them are women currently. And that has grown, that is up almost 20% over the last few years. 
One of the things boards have had to deal with extensively is related to activists. And that is, is because the nominating committee is the one seeing creating the composition, skill sets, and quality of the board, that they are the ones that are under the greatest scrutiny when an activist goes ahead and comes in and looks at the composition of the board and starts to talk about what they like and don't like to do that. Now, different activists have different goals, be it financial goals, be it strategic goals, be it environmental issues or a variety of things, a strategic wanting to divest of a certain subsidiary to get maximum value and so forth. The thing I would like to let you know is, uh, well, one, as a brief aside, at Hydric, we will not work with activists. We deal with them a lot because they're on a lot of our board, so it's not like we're devoid of it. And one of the interesting things is they come in all shapes and sizes. And some of the bigger known that you'll see in the press regularly tend to go ahead and be a little bit more aggressive antagonistic. But we also have worked with boards where the activists basically are able to integrate into the board well, be very reasonable, very practical, not so mono agenda focused on their one thing. So they do come in different flavors. Our favorite question to ask, which we ask in all our board interviews when putting a new board member on, is the other board members, how long do they plan on staying and being on the board? Mm -hmm. And for the activists, those questions come in all different um, shapes and sizes. And often we get none of your exploited business, but others will go ahead and talk <laughs> about it. Here's our goals, here's where we're looking to go ahead and leave and so forth. But the thing I want to point out is none ends up being front and center on the activist side but all activists are not created equal. So understanding the activist goals, intentions, and timeframes are kind of key in how that impacts the nominating committee. And that kind of concludes my comments for now. Great, thanks Dave for, for kicking us off. I, I guess a question for you before we move on to Travis would be, you know, you, you talked about diversity and, you know, 35% of board leadership are, are gender today, which is up significantly. Um, and it's clear based upon all the research and, and the movements afoot for the last five, maybe even 10 years, that diverse perspectives and experiences have demonstrated value time and time again. So we're, we're no longer debating whether it's a good idea or not. Um, but I guess my question is if we're really honest with ourselves about the progress we've been making on the diversity front, uh, and it gets defined in a lot of different ways. Um, right. But how would we say we are doing would be the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is if we're not quite there yet, what are a couple of things that you're seeing and, and recommending to companies to accelerate that pace of change? So uh, we've actually made good progress and it is a huge theme in the boardroom and on the board searches that we do. To put in perspective kind of where we are today, as you know, women make up more than half of the citizens in North America. When you look at the S&P, currently, it's currently at about 32% of the board members are um, gender diverse, and there's various types of diversity, so we'll talk about one or two of them. Um, at the same time, with the George Floyd period and incident that happened, the rise of racial and ethnic diversity became big. And to put in perspective, we're probably about in the fifth inning on the gender diversity issue. We're probably in about the second or third inning of a nine inning baseball game, to pick an analogy here, of the diversity as it relates to race and ethnicity. So we're only at about 22% there. But to give you a sense, last year in the S&P 500, 46%, almost half of all new board members were um, women and 46% were also uh, ethnically, uh, racially diverse. So that number goes up and up every year. And a lot of them are also, for that reason, first time board members. It's created a little bit of a rebound because so many new board members are now being brought on. We're continuing to see expansive expansion of companies wanting to go ahead and have board members that actually have experience and CEOs as current board members is a very high demand category. We've seen that grow to kind of counterbalance the new board members that are coming on. Another new area we see now, it's still nascent, it's only been going on for about two years, is uh, age diversity. 
And then there is more and more, especially companies where technology and dealing with um, retail and individual customers is a big deal on the growth of millennials and Gen Z. And generally, age diversity, you qualify for that for those on the line that want to know if, you, if your number starts with a four, roughly, um, to do that. But what happens is how it's changed the world and what we have had to do more with our board is make them more open, more tolerant. Because at the end of the day, we tell them you can't have it all. You can't have board experience. You can't have previous CEO experience. And you can't have age. The average age of a Russell 1000 board member, I think, is like 62 or 61 and a half. So mm -hmm. you can't have all those. You're going to have to work to get that diversity at other CC positions, which is working. CHROs, chief marketing officers, chief administrative officers, General counsel, many of those are more female uh, dominated as gender, for example, and some ethnically too. They become much more open to that idea and that's opened up the door for many of those. Hey Dave, I, I know we talked about just the one question, but as, as you talk, uh, a second one comes to mind. When you think about moving away from public company experience and CEO, which was the, you know, those were the first two things people were looking for not too long ago and you open those criteria, or you say those criteria aren't the absolute critical ones, you get younger folks, you get folks who maybe aren't in the boardroom as much as a sitting CEO or CFO. How is board orientation changing to bring those people up to speed quicker? Yeah, so Dennis, you've hit it on the head. So I literally will call people now because of the board members saying this needs to be a diverse board member. People have bought into this. They realize the companies are better for it. So we're in the, it's real. We have to make the case anymore of why you need diversity. I think everybody realizes the benefits. So I now call women. I think minorities that are in their 40s and like, oh, yeah, board service. So when I get near retirement, I'm like, no, I'm calling you now. You're 44. You're CFO of this company. Would you be interested? And I will have to explain to them, what does it mean? What's the time commitment? And NACD does a great job encapsulating how much time and effort it is because you can't take it lightly. With that said, that is what's up the induction game. And so now they will regularly put these new board members on planes before even the first meeting to go to other site locations, manufacturing locations to get them up to speed and meet with a long slate of the management team, which is new too, more exposure to management because of that reason. But not only that, heavily with the other directors and many of them now have a mentorship program and they'll actually have them sit next to that person during the meeting so they can get a sense of what, because some, it's one extreme or the other, either they're silent for the first two meetings, kind of like we hired you for your thoughts and the mentor will help with that or vice versa. Of, that's a relevant comment, but you're not the CEO of this company. That detail is for him, not for you or her. And so the mentors do a great job of kind of guiding them on trying to be as effective as possible. Great. Thanks, Dave. And, and more importantly, thanks for kicking us off. That was a great conversation. So